a lot of what I'm going to say may be new and grassroots to them, and it may be review for you, so please accept that because I really want to do a total overview. The other disclaimer I want to say is that I have to thank Annika Becca. She mentioned that we have been friends for a long time. Annika Becca has been my mentor for many, many years in the area of women's health. And she is the one that reinforces with me on a day-by-day -day basis that when we look at our patients, we're not just looking at the numbers. We're not just looking at the BMI. We're not just looking at the waist circumference. The people are made up of also a spiritual and a physical well-being. And one of the things that I love about functional medicine is that that's what we try to take into account. And so a lot of the things that she addressed this morning when she was talking about where is that person coming from? Because we know that the effects of stress on the body is absolutely tremendous. So I would also like to thank her and um, the committee for inviting me to come today. Um, I'm going to start out with a prayer. You all know the prayer of a sissy? What's the prayer of a sissy? God grant me the courage to change the things I can, the ability to accept the things that I cannot change, and the wisdom to know the difference. And what I think has happened in medicine is that second one, the things that we cannot change, it's not on this slide, is a disability. It is a disability that we just say that you are at risk. I'm thinking of a patient that came to me and let me just give you a little background first. I, my practice is equidistance between um, Mohegan Sun or the Mohegan Pequot Indians and the Mashantucket. Now I know Vegas is a big, there's casinos everywhere. But in Connecticut we have two large casinos that when a person finds out that they have that percentage of Indian blood to be part of that and with the casino revenue, some of these people that are elders actually get checks upwards of $100,000 a month just because they're Indian. You know, this is kind of like if you win the lotto. Did you see the person walking around with the uh, armor suit on? Says, I won the lotto. I don't want anything to happen to me. Okay. Well, if you were given $100,000 a month, wouldn't you want to live and enjoy that money? So I had a woman come to me and she said, okay, I am 50 years old. My 51-year-old sister was just diagnosed with breast cancer, and the two of them are tribal, tribal elders. She said she, was, she had a mastectomy, she was undergoing chemotherapy and radiation, and in the middle of that, they felt a lump in the other breast, and she was diagnosed with contralateral breast cancer. They removed that mastectomy. Now, this is a woman that has the best insurance in the world, all the money in the world, to spend on trying to stay alive. And no matter what they did to her, she was dying. So the younger sister went to her doctor and said, I am scared half to death. My sister is dying of breast cancer. I don't want to get breast cancer. What can I do? And you know what she was told? Get a yearly mammography. She said, but you don't understand. I want to prevent breast cancer. And they said, well, have a yearly mammography. And the answer was, well, at least we'll know earlier when you have it. So that's when she came to me. So I think the whole purpose of the time that I have with you today is that I want to, and I don't know if this pointer is working and I don't think it really is, but if you look at um, the development of breast cancer, most of the time people are picked up with breast cancer when they are in the invasive stages or in the much larger, would you agree? Because I can have women that have mammograms done every year and then all of a sudden one year they show this big huge tumor. That all evolved. You know what? It didn't start within the last 365 days. So what I would like to do is bring you through the things that I do in my practice where I am trying to identify women long before they get to that point there. Um, if you look at it, it says that a five-year survival rate is for tumors um, less than um, um, 20, 82% for tumors between 20 and 50, 63%. I don't know about you, but I really don't like those, those odds. So here we go. Well, 
and most of you have been around in medicine probably as long as I have, so you are very familiar with the Gale model. And the Gale model now, you don't even have to add it up on your own. All you do is plug it into a computer and it does the calculations for you. But it's based upon whether or not you have a medical history of atypical hyperplasia and a woman's age. I really take offense to that, so why would they think just because I'm a year older that, that somehow increases my risk. My slogan in my practice is a year older, a year younger. So I really take, I take offense to that one. But in, in the scheme of things, they are thinking that every year that you are older, it is that much more time that the estrogen receptors in your body have been exposed um, to estrogen. They look at the age of menarche because they also think of that as the beginning, obviously, when your estrogen receptors. In terms of menarche, I have a girlfriend who is a pediatric endocrinologist in San Francisco. And when we look at what I call the exogenous forms of estrogen-like substances, you know, all the BPA, all the, you know, I, 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 I know of kids that if they didn't have it in something cellophane and put it in a microwave, they wouldn't think it was food. So you look at all the BPA that's being, you know, absorbed during the microwavable process. We look at all the baby bottles that have been made with BPA. These, the, she sees a whole population of children that have been exposed to what we call the these estrogen mimickers, these toxic estrogen substances that have full, you ready for this? Full menarche at the age of six. And she will put them on Lupron, which is, I don't know, I remember it being $4,000 a shot. It's probably more than that now. And she will put them on a shot of Lupron on a monthly basis until the mother is able to cap capable of dealing with a young child with menstruating. Is this not scary? So, and also you look at the um, age of the first live birth, um, and um, and, and we're, I'm going to be getting into that as to why we think that is very, very important or being nulliparous. Um, previous breast biopsies, um, I think we are missing a lot of that. I saw an article in the New England Journal of Medicine about two weeks ago that said the amount of services that you get for a symptom is related to the amount of services that are available in the facility in which you are seen. And also probably your... Um, your insurance. So I'm thinking that being able to say how many previous biopsies, we are missing a lot of people that maybe should have been biopsied, but they are putting zero in in terms of under the Gale model. Also race, race ethnicity and also the first degree, um, number of first degree relatives. Now I think a lot of people get zero in that because if you're adopted or you have no sisters or you have no female aunts or your mom died in a car accident at the age of 30, how would you even know that they have any predisposition. So do you think, I, I see how this scale model really, really underestimates. So what I would like to do is I would like to show what I think is a paradigm shift in how we should look at our patients that are at risk for breast cancer.